if the doctrine of baptism is to be fully grasped, it must be seen as an integral part of God's single plan of salvation. Hence, we must first place baptism in the setting of the covenant. In this connection, we notice how the New Testament finds in baptism fundamental parallels with the three greatest Old Testament administrations of the covenant. In the plan of salvation, I'm repeating myself now, and we can't understand baptism without the entire plan. We look back then to the Old Testament, and it's in this connection we notice how the New Testament finds in baptism fundamental parallels with the three greatest Old Testament administrations uh, of the covenant. Now the first parallel has to do with the Noahic covenant, the flood of Noah. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 22, the New Testament calls attention to it looking back because it tells us something about baptism. And in that chapter, reading with me, beginning with the 18th verse, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a, a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight saved, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, wherein to even baptism, doth also now save us, not putting the way on the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. I want to quickly say that he, in, in, I'm so glad for the parentheses, for he's not saying that baptism saves us, but he's telling you what the symbolism, baptism is a symbol of something that takes place, and he goes right ahead and says what it is. Not uh, water, not the putting away of the filth of flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now, look at this. The real meaning is here. Also now save us, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, the saving is not by baptism. Baptism typifies something, but saved by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So the Old Testament has a parallel here of baptism, something that the Old Testament account typified in the Noahic Covenant. And however difficult this passage is, in many respects, one thing is quite plain. That Peter displays baptism as the Christians escape from judgment and transition into the kingdom of God. Baptism then is a sign that you will pass through the judgment, unscathed or unharmed, and that the Christian will pass through the judgment on sin secure in Christ. <laughs> These that are going to be baptized today, when they go down in the water, it's a sign and a sure sign their whole souls having been sins, but, uh, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is a sign and an authentication that they're going to pass through the judgment unscathed and unharmed. Did you know your baptism meant that? Oh yeah, no wonder it makes devils so uh, aggravated, especially in the heathen countries. I'm still recalling that in the heathen countries, whenever you're really converted, uh, it doesn't seem to stir the heathen. It stirs the fires of hell, but it seems to disturb the heathen. But whenever you're baptized, they cut you off. So baptism has uh, a meaning and a significance and an authentication that causes somehow the devils to, uh, to stir up the peoples of the foreign nations. Uh, peoples of the heathen countries, and I suppose it happens here in this country too, but more so in foreign countries. Baptism then, in the Noahic covenant, is a sign that you're going to pass through the judgment untouched. Oh, I'm happy about that. When I think what's going to happen at the judgment, when I think of the people calling for the rocks and the, and the hills to fall upon them and hide them from the face of God, if the devil's around the Baptist Jew, he won't be, but if he were, you could point back and say, whoop, wait a minute, weren't you there at my baptism? 
That was the sign. Oh, yeah, something happened on here, but that was the outward sign that I'm passing through the desert unscathed. By the blood of Jesus, I'm going to make it through. Well, not only is there a parallel in the Noahic covenant, but there's a parallel in the Abrahamic covenant. covenant. Under this parallel, there are two lines of New Testament teaching. Turn with me to Colossians 2.13, and we'll look at the first line. Then we'll look at the second. Maybe we better read, uh, beginning with the 10th verse, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he's spiritualizing something here, pointing back uh, to the Abrahamic, uh, Abrahamic covenant, in the circumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Paul here equates deadness in trespasses with uncircumcision, referring to the Old Testament sign. But he's referring not just to the sign, but he's referring to the meaning of that sign. And uncircumcision, under the Abrahamic covenant, covenant meant that a man was not acquainted, was he had an utter lack of acquaintance with the renewing work of God. He had an utter lack of acquaintance with the renewing work of God. Now, the real circumcision in the Old Testament is where men, Abraham in particular, are quickened to new life through faith in God. Consequently, Paul can say of Christians, who knew the quickening work of God in Christ by the Holy Spirit, that they are the circumcision. The reality of faith has been fulfilled in them. I marvel that the Judaizers would place such an emphasis upon circumcision when Abraham was not was really uh, cleansed by faith, you see. It was under the, the later times that circumcision came. But, under Abraham, the real circumcision was really as it is now, a circumcision that is worked by faith, and a circumcision that is worked in the inner heart of every man that places his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the second is uh, in conjunction with the first. Secondly, what circumcision was in the covenant of Abraham, baptism is to the Christian. Romans 4 Circumcision 4.11, circumcision is called a seal. And in 2 Corinthians 1 and 21 and 22 and in Ephesians 1 and 13, the same word refers to baptism. In other words, uh, circumcision had some meaning. It had the meaning uh, of authentication or the proof that this man was accepted by God. It had the meaning that this man was under the protection of God. I'm talking about circumcision now. And it had, the, it had the meaning that God owned this man. It had the meaning of ownership. All the meanings, you see, that a seal would have. This legal seal that's put upon these documents, especially in the days of old. So it is with baptism. Whenever we're baptized... It is, it is like the sign of circumcision in the Old Testament. That is its true meaning under the Abrahamic covenant. Covenant. It means that we are authentically gods. It is the proof to the church, as I say, to the world and to the devil that a real inner work has taken place. As we often say, an outward sign of an inward work. It also means that we're under the protection of God. Well, this is, this is exciting, isn't it? <laughs> say, well, Brother Oak, I didn't know the baptism meant that much. I didn't either, but I got to study about it and found out about it. And 
And I, and I found out it's thrilling. I was especially thrilled that there are these fundamental parallels. Noatic, Abrahamic, and another one I'm going to mention was the, is the Mosaic parallel. All and every case, the New Testament is pointing back to some significant meaning of our baptism. Ownership ought to mean something to us. We don't own our own lives. God owns our own lives. One of my disappointments in modern Christianity and nominal Christianity, and Christianity that's not real, is that we really don't have the bondservant uh, relationship in view. I had to have someone call me from another state to ask me, where, where did I, how could I back up the statement that in Christ Jesus we have no rights? Uh, Paul makes it clear in his writings. The word power in the Corinthian letter many times could be and should be translated right. In Christ, he said he had no power. In, um, in himself, he had no rights. His rights were only in Christ. When he came to Christ, he gave up all rights. And God became his owner. Whereas he was somewhat, that is, in control of his own soul. Now, under the gospel dispensation, under the gospel dispensation, God is in control of his own life. So this seal is a seal of authentication. It is a seal of ownership. And I tell you, we ought to take it seriously. We ought to be thrilled about it. And we ought to, by God's grace, do the very best we know uh, to appreciate the symbolism of what is taking place. Finally, I want to mention the Mosaic Covenant. My friends, this one probably stirs me more than the other two. I mean, I'm thrilled about It's a sign that we're going through the judgment. I'm thrilled that the it is a sign of authentication. Uh, it is a sign of ownership. It is a sign of protection. I'm telling you, when I read the words of 1 Corinthians 10, I hardly know what to do with myself. Listen with me as I read the words of Paul. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For well, they drank of that spiritual rock which, that followed them that was the rock, Christ Jesus. You might be interested to know this typifies the Lord's Supper, drinking of the rock in the Old Testament. But with most, the Greek says, but with many, but the Greek says, but with most of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Yes. Now these things were our examples. That is, these things are written that you and I might learn something to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sit down and they eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. And Paul says, Now all these things happen unto us for end samples or as examples, and they are written for admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And this has meaning. For our baptism, the word baptize, of course, is mentioned here. Remember now, in the Noahic covenant, in the covenant that was made with Moses, baptism is typified as an escape from judgment. And then in the Abrahamic covenant that Paul refers to, Circumcision shows baptism to be the seal of God's approval, protection, and ownership upon the life of the believer. But now, Paul issues a profound warning against resting on the outward sign. That's what he's saying in the 10th chapter. Against resting on the outward sign. He's saying right here, that there must be a life of obedience for this sign to be valid. They would point to their circumcision. 
They would make it known that they were the children of Abraham and the sign of circumcision indicated that they indeed were. Paul's saying right here, they disobeyed God. They lived, they went back to lives of disobedience, fornication, and murmuring, and tempted God, and died in the wilderness. They were relying on an outward sign. I want to tell you today, no matter who tells you, I cannot find it in God's Word that baptism saves anybody. A man's got to be saved before he's baptized. And I'm not, uh, I'm not getting after people, but I'm just getting after a false doctrine. Really, I'm not. Oh, I tell you, I hope you're as stirred as I am some way. The Israelite baptism symbolized separation. I'm talking about the Mosaic Covenant now. When they went to the Red Sea, the waters closed and swallowed up Pharaoh and his chariots. Whenever the blood of Christ washes away your sin, your baptism is to indicate that you're totally separate from the old world. You've stopped all your murmuring. You've stopped all your disobedience. You've stopped all the fornication and all the sensuality of this earth. And you're living for God a life of obedience. Oh, what a tremendous thing. And Paul issues this warning for us today in order that baptism may be a sign that we are separated unto God. Well, I was so excited about this, I wanted to share it before you were baptized this morning. I felt like maybe this might mean more to you as you go down. The sign that you're going through the judgment unscathed. A sign of God's seal of ownership and protection upon your life and proof that you really belong to God. But also a sign that you're not trusting in an outward thing, in an outward symbol or an outward ritual but a sign that you've been separated from the old life and you're walking with God. You see, it was indicated in the Noatic, baptism free from judgment. It was indicated in the Abrahamic that circumcision, you see, was an outward right really to mean that there was an inward change, that a man walks by faith, and that he's, this, this was a seal indicating God's protection and God's ownership and, and the authentication that this man really belonged to God. And finally in the mosaic, as they walked through the old Red Sea where the land was dry, and then the waters came back, they were separated unto God. But it meant nothing. It meant nothing to some of them, it would seem. For they were not really changed. You see, God cannot save a people as a whole only as those individuals are willing to submit to him. He's never violated the will of man. There were people who were not true Israelites. Paul makes it clear that, that a man that's a true Jew is, is true is spiritually speaking. That we that are Christians are true Jews if we have an interchange of heart and life on the inside. So I'm more thrilled about, well, I'm thrilled about them all. But I want to mention one other thing. There is blessing associated with baptism. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 for a final verse will tell us something about the blessing of baptism. Praise God forevermore. In the third chapter, in the 26 and the 27th verse, he says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. For if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. My dear ones, I'll tell you something. Your baptism is the authentication of your sonship. Your baptism is an authentication that you are a child of God and all the spiritual blessings that are coming to God's children are now yours by inheritance. All the wonder we said in the Ephesians letter, we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We've been in heavenly places this morning. I'll tell you, I, I wish you had the victory. Uh, really, I'm no one. But I wish you had the victory uh, in your heart that I had when I was saying God will take me through there's only one thing that will keep you from that victory. That's a life of disobedience, a life of murmuring, a life of complaining. 
Oh, my Lord, I'm crying for people these years to obey God. I want them to take a stand. I want them to take a stand for devotedness, for trueness, for love and faithfulness. I'm not interested in any other stand until they've first taken that one. Brother, when they've taken that one, I've got respect for what they say. When they've been faithful and consistent and obedient and they've been on the fire line year after year, I tremble when they speak. Say, yes. so, my Lord, help me to listen. God wants us to know that we've been separated unto Him and our baptism is a sign that we've been separated unto Him and that we are His Son. Remember He said to Jesus, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. As we're identified with Christ, we become His beloved. He said, No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. The reason I've got the victory this morning is for the last nine, more than nine years, I've walked as consistently as I know how to walk. Where I've been out of order, where I've been wrong, I've asked Jesus to forgive me. I've had to do it. And things I didn't even sure about, I asked Jesus to forgive me. Because Steve and I were in the car yesterday, and he had made a little comment three or four weeks ago that wouldn't hardly bother any of you, but it bothered him. He said, Brother, I want to ask you to forgive me. He's on his way out of town. He came by the barbershop from... Wayne's and Dorsters and came by the barber shop and he got out of there to ask me to forgive him. And you know what? He was right when he said, I want you to forgive me. God dealt in his heart and said, You did the right thing. You needed this cleansing. Steve's one of the most sensitive, pure young men that walks this earth. I, I tell you, boy's words reliable. Stays on his knees, and though you may have walked with God, or supposedly 10, 20, 30, and 40 years, you'll have to go a long way to walk as pure as that young man walks. Yes, Brother, I'm telling you, I listen to what he has to say. I listen to him carefully because he's known, he's known carnality, and he's known it in, in, in hard remarks. He's got wounds on his spiritual body. Yes. Mama tells me that he's persecuted from the time he was a little child. He didn't, didn't know why. A sensitive a very sensitive, loving man who gets thrilled about Jesus. Oh, and the buzzers light in on him. That's all right. He's shining more today than he was when they start, first started pecking on him. Boy, when he stood behind this desk yesterday, he got that way he does it. You know, he's got a way of doing it. Hair blocks a little bit, and he gets that fist like that. <laughs> he said, from darkness unto light, I tell you, I felt the power of God. I said, Lord, one thing I know, that man loves thee. He's got a pure heart, and he's separated unto God, and his baptism was real. <laughs> Inward and outward, that's what I'm saying this morning. His baptism was real. I tell you, one of the one of the bad signs of nominal Christianity is they don't believe what men who are poor and walk with God say. They trust the men of carnal judgment. Brother, I don't, I never have. Oh my life, if a man's going to tell me anything, I want to know, first of all, has he loved me? I want to know if he's loved you. I want to know if he's walked with God. Has he been consistent? Has he been faithful? Or has he, has he put out something that's damaged people across the land? Steve hadn't done it. And his baptism is an authentic one. Oh, this is wonderful. I'm so excited about it. I hardly know what to do, but I promise to be the one who baptizes today. Think of it. No good thing will it withhold from them that walk up rightly. The only security I have is in the fact that my baptism is authentic. I'm on my God, and you're on my God through the blood. Let me tell you something. Don't you be like those children of Israel who went through the ride, who went through the outward sign of walking through the Red Sea. But what happened? They got over on the other side and they got looking back at the old country. They got to murmur and got to complain and they wanted the flesh pots of Egypt. I tell you, I marvel at you folks. God will bless you a little. You measure up a little and then you're gone. God will bless you a little, you measure up a little, and then the victory's gone. The next time I see you, I marvel at it. I marvel at it. I wonder at it. I tell you the thing that thrills my soul. If you say by your life of obedience that my baptism was really real, I'm separated unto God for eternity. Oh, may God help us this morning. I tell you, folks, if you love God, you ought to be thrilled. I never preached a sermon like this on baptism in my life. Dick Davis is going to be baptized this morning. I have a feeling it's going to mean an awful lot to him. Jane McIntosh was so little, she didn't know what baptism meant. 
But she's going to be baptized this morning, re-baptized, not because we're requiring these things. She belongs to Jesus by the blood. But she's going to have more understanding what it means this morning and be able to say to the devils and to hell and to all of the world and to the church, I belong to God. I'm separated unto Him. And by His grace, my life is and will be in the future one of obedience. And of course, may I just refer back to the first one. When I go through the judgment, I'm going through unharmed. Boy, well, Chuck, when you look at your daughter and you know that it's a real baptism, you know that it's the authentic sign that when this age is over and she's sure to come short, and when our Lord gives the cry of acclamation, when the sky is split, to be in a service for the Holy Spirit is blessing yeah. and anointing and uh, that was surely a surprise for me but it was wonderful it's all I could do to stay there so brother why didn't you take off well I, I would have had just a little more I'd have been gone oh I fed myself when Joe started singing the power was so strong you felt it didn't you by God's grace it's in my heart that you felt it praise the Lord well, it is almost an impossibility to be like Jesus without being like a man. That's why I put the church here. There's no way really to comprehend what the scriptures say unless you see it demonstrated through a man.